Annie, we are glad that you are here. Um, hey, before we get going, I want to say a couple of things real quick. Welcome online. Um, welcome in person. Good to see you guys today. Uh, what I want to say is this, is that we, since its inception, like we are in a couple of months about to celebrate our fifth birthday as a church, right? It's incredible. And I have not done the hard math yet. There's a few of us that probably need to jump in and do the hard math so I can report and give you an honorable number that is the truth, as we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about truth-telling. Um, but I think that as a church, in our first five years, we've given something like a quarter million dollars away, which is insane, right? It's cool. Because we've talked about from the early days that if, you know, God forbid we ever cease to exist, we want to be a church that is just poured so much into our community that there is there would be a deep groaning or deep longing in our absence um so that said hey um we have got uh, a few weeks before our christmas offering so i need you to start getting prepared for that um which which i guess what i'm trying to say is don't spend all your money um on christmas and prepared so that we can give sacrificially and generously outside of what you know to what we are doing as a church um, not for what we're doing here, but for what we want to do for our community and for our neighbors um, out there. And, uh, and, and I mean, honestly, we're, we're just spending the last couple bucks of last year's Christmas offering. Um, we've done our, our final serve day back in September, but now um, in the next couple of weeks, we are going to be serving 150 families in need Thanksgiving dinner. And we're doing that still from your generosity from last year, last Christmas offering. And if you hit that QR code on your seat, you can sign up to, to serve that. That is one of my favorite events to be at. So I have one of those spots already. I will be there because I love um, serving the, the, the frozen turkey and putting it in people's trunks and, and some of that stuff. It's just fun. Um, so you can do that. But also I want to get you to pr prepare um, to give for our Christmas offering sacrificially and generously um, so that we can continue to bless our community. Last year we raised 40,000, like $43,000 and three, $43,003 and like six cents or something like that. So let's, let's do it again. Let's prepare. Um, I also will say this is not just through our Christmas offering, but through other various things right now in our courtyard, we have Colleen out there and she's got the little tree there and on the tree represents kids that live in an orphanage in Tijuana. And you can, you can grab one of the pieces of paper and in it, it talks about the kids and some of the, their likes and, and dislikes and stuff. And then you can shop for them for Christmas. Okay, and bring those gifts in the next few weeks or next couple weeks, and then you can be a part of even signing up to taking those gifts down to an orphanage. Um, I think it's on December 8th, but we're not going to let too many of you go because we got to have church still that day right here. So, but a few of y'all can go. <laughs> and if you get signed up real quick. So, um, all that said, um, we've got some exciting stuff coming up this Christmas um, to which as a church, we can be generous and be sacrificial and give of ourselves as Jesus instructed and commanded. So um, I said that, let me say one more thing before we get going, okay? Tuesday's the election. Tuesday's the election. That said, what I want to do right now is I want to pray right now as a church body, as people, that at least Church 180, I'm gonna pray for all the churches in San Diego in our country, but at least Church 180, that we can be little Christs, that we can be Christians, this election, that we would not put our hope in the next leader of our country, but that we would put our hope in a resurrected savior, um, and that we would exercise our right as a, as a free people who live in a great nation, but we would not be uh, a part of a society that is about name calling and just ugliness and, and all the, all the garbage that you just see whenever you turn on the news or watch the news, that we would not be caught up in that, but we'd be caught up in Jesus' business and that we'd be caught up as his followers in the midst of it. You, you hear me on that? So, so I, I'm just going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for me that we can just be people of integrity and be people who follow Christ well and extend his light in a dark world. 
um, right now. So, Jesus, I, I pray for it all. I pray for this message. I pray for this week. I pray, Lord, that we would be people who, um, God, put our hope in you um, more than any man or woman. That we would be people who fall at your feet in worship, Lord. That we would uh, be people who passionately love the things you love, hate the things that you hate. Um, that we would hold our convictions, we would hold them with integrity and love, Lord. That we would be people who um, that, that, that emulate and model you um, to a world, uh, Lord, that doesn't. And so, God, help us, give us the integrity, give us the courage, and give us the resilience um, to be uh, just close followers of you in the next few days. It's in your name we pray. Amen. It's no coincidence, but uh, today we are carrying on in our series called The Road Less Travel, and we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount, right? And we are talking today about truth-telling. <laughs> Here we go, <laughs> right? And, and so what we've said, I don't have time to recap or anything like that because we've gone, this is our fifth week in the series, but what we've said is that there is a wide road, okay, with which many people are on. Many people in San Diego, many people in South San Diego, many people in the United States of America, many people in the world at large. There is a wide road that many people are on, but what Jesus said is that this road leads to destruction, but that he invites us, he challenges us, he encourages us, and he equips us through his teaching to take the road less traveled. There is a narrower road, there is a smaller road that fewer people are following, but this is the road that leads to life. And what we've said and what we've seen throughout each week is that to follow his teachings as laid out in the Sermon on the Mount is like taking this narrow road. It's like taking the road less traveled. And so here we are, okay, fifth week, and we are not even out of chapter five yet. We got Christmas coming, y'all. We're not even out of chapter five yet because we said it's Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7, and here we are, um, our fifth week, Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, and we are going to look at truth-telling. But before we get going, I got four kids. Sorry, Ruthie. Ruthie's in here at service today. Um, I, I got kids' stories. None, of, none about her today, what is it, okay, what is it about kids that are so good at lying, right? Like my four-year-old, William, okay, he, like I had a story prepared, but then I was like, well, yesterday morning then happened. Yesterday morning, I kid you not, Halloween, you know, ended. They went trick-or-treating. They got all the candy in the neighborhood. Um, and, and, and so we've been giving them a little bit more candy than usual lately, and we're, you know, a little bit more apt to say yes, and then at some point this week, the door closes and no more candy, right? For a while. And it just becomes a community bin that you get for good behavior and incentives and all these other things. But for right now, we've been a little bit more liberal with it, but, um, but, but lately, uh, well, not lately, yesterday morning, William, I did not know that he had negotiated with mom. And mom had said, hey, you can have some candy, but you need to eat breakfast first, okay? And I don't know this conversation's happened. I've done my workout in the garage, and, and I'm co I come back in, and William's like, hey, can I have a piece of candy, Dad? And, and, you know, and, and I'm, I'm like, well, I guess one. It's, after, it's, still, it's two days after Halloween, right? Here you go. Have your, have your candy. And I go back upstairs to take my wife a coffee, and, and she's like, did you give him candy? I told him no candy. And then he's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> he literally, no, you didn't. And it's like, yes, I did. <laughs> And it's like, what is it about kids that just have such an easy time lying? I mean, we can catch that kid with chocolate oozing down his cheek. And like, no, I didn't have any chocolate. Like, it's in your mouth still. You little liar. <laughs> right? And, and, and yeah, just, it's, it's crazy. I did a little research this week, and I'm going to emphasize the word little research, Okay. And this does not go well for me in some ways, but I did a little research this week on Google, CBS survey that said this. It says, we, you and I, we lie on average as a society four to 15 times per day. Four to 15 times per day. Um, this is the part that's not good. Men, on average, lie six times per day. And women, on average, lie three times per day. What is it about men? 
what the heck? Um, if, okay, I, I, I did this. If we only lie four times a day, we would lie 1,460 times per year. It's if, if you're on the lower end of, of, of lying, you only lie 1,460 times a year. I mean, the upper end, I didn't do the math for you. You can do it 15 times 365. Go for it. We are lied to on average of 10 to 200 times per day. We are lied to. We are 54% accurate in detecting lies. That's it. I would think we were better. I think I'm better, but I don't know. And evidently, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, teenagers. We are, this is probably why we are a church that's bent on the next generation. Like we sacrificially serve our community. That's one of our distinctions. And then another thing we say is that we uh, overinvest. We overinvest into the next generation. We believe in that. And I guess one of the reasons that we overinvest into the next generation is that studies have shown that teens are the biggest liars in culture. Sorry, that's just what the studies say. <laughs> Crazy, right? And I think about this and I'm like, well, why? Why do we lie? Why do we lie? Okay, I think there's four reasons why we lie. Just real quick reasons. It's easier to lie sometimes. I think that we think we'll look better when we lie sometimes. I think we lie to save face sometimes. And I think that sometimes we think that the lie will get us ahead in life. Nonetheless, here's the, here's the thing. The tension that we all live in is that we live in a world where the trustworthiness of our words is routinely questioned, right? We do. We live in a world where the trustworthiness of what comes out of your mouth and what comes out of my mouth is routinely questioned. And what we are going to learn from this passage today that we're going to study in the Sermon on the Mount is that the integrity of our words is central to our witness to Jesus. The integrity of our words is central to our witness to Jesus. So without further ado, let's jump in. We're Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, and it says this. It says, again, you, so, so let me stop, stop you right there, because I, I said we weren't going to do too much recap, but I have to do this because Jesus said it there. He said, again, and this is Jesus once again going back in their minds to Mount Sinai and Moses and the Ten Commandments. And him once again saying, I am the new Moses. Because what did we see? What did we hear, right? You, do, you don't have to have grown up in church, be around church very often. You've heard the thou shalt not a lot of times in our culture. And last week we talked about thou shalt not murder. It got turned into anger. And this week we're talking about thou shalt not lie. And then Jesus is going to fill in his commentary for being the new Moses, for what Moses had said to the people of Israel at that time. And he says this, he says again, You've heard it said to the, that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear on an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one, one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. That's harsh. See, and, and, and here's what I want to do. I want to unpack what Jesus is getting at and the, the historical context and setting that's going on there. And then I want to talk about what this means for you and what it means for me, if that's cool. So this was written primarily to an oral society. Okay, so what, what I mean by that is that very few people could read and write uh, in, in this time and in this culture. So much of what, what of they, how the way that they functioned was through oral words, right? Your word was your promise. Your word was your oath. Your word was your bond. Like they, this was pre contracts. This was pre litigation. This was pre I'm going to take you to court. This is pre, like, what we say in our day and age is like, I need that in writing, right? Well, they didn't have it in writing because they couldn't write, okay? So this is why so much of Scripture talks about how to, to, to do this before witnesses, right? Because it's like, okay, together we are going to hear you say that so that we can say we, not I, heard you say this thing that came out of your mouth. This is an oral society. 
And, and, and what's happening here, like here is they are, they're swearing by their oaths. So they're, they're giving their word, and then they are, in turn, trying to add something onto their word to give their word an oomph, like a, like a little bit more legitimacy, right? And so I, I think about that with me, and it's like going back to my kids. It's like inevitably, like my kids lately, they're always playing with their friends out back. They're always, you know, up to good and no good out back. And even right now, it's like they're, they're out back a lot of times, and they put together little creations, and then they get out a table from our backyard, and they start to sell things to our neighbors in our neighborhood. Whether that be bracelets or baked goods or anything that they think of, they're like, okay, let's sell this stuff. And I mean, it's only going to be a couple of days before they start selling the candy that was given to them by their neighbors back to their neighbors in some kind of weird packaging, a good packaging, right? But what ends up happening is that whatever they're doing, specifically with these sales that they do, the thing that I like is that they're having to negotiate with each other, right? negotiate with their siblings, negotiate with their neighbors, negotiate with whatever, and inevitably I'll be listening and working on something in the garage or whatever, and you will hear the words come out of one of their mouth in the form of negotiation, and it'll be like, hey, we've worked out some terms and we've worked out all this stuff, and then the phrase will come, do you promise, right? Because that word prom, like, yes, I promise, right? That is just a form of adding an oomph to what you've said, right? And so right here in this culture, this society, this day, this age, for them to swear on God was like, you had to do what you said you were going to do if you swear on God. So they wouldn't swear on God. And they would swear on things like holy cities, right? And they would swear on different things like, I swear to you on Jerusalem that I'm going to do this. And they found it as a loophole for adding oomph to a promise that they were making, but one that they could loophole their way out of if they did not want to do that and to become a little bit wishy-washy. So Jesus comes in and he's like, don't swear on your head. Don't swear on Jerusalem. Don't swear on these things because you're going to be wishy-washy. Instead, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Don't promise at all. No yeses, no no's, whatever. I think about this too, and I'm sorry, this is my last kid's story. But I think about, for me, um, this, this past summer, we've had a great summer. And we did a lot of uh, bike rides at night, and we, we would go look at sunsets. And we got to the point where we would drive, uh, bike out to the, the local park, and we got a four-year-old going, and he's biking and whatever, and we would, we would try to time the sunset, okay? And we would time the sunset, and, and my kids got to the point where they could count it down, and like, Dun! at first we were like a minute off all the time, but then towards the end of summer, we were like, we got this pretty nailed down. We know when the sun's like right there, whatever. And, and many of those bike rides ended um, by, or began with us saying, hey, if you are good, at the end of the bike ride, we'll, we'll scoop you a bowl of ice, of ice cream, right? And, and then it would end like, hey, you were good or you weren't good, and here's your ice cream, here's the cookie dough, here's the chocolate, here's the whatever. But some of these days, Kelsey and I would legitimately be like, we, we cannot in good faith as good parents give them any more junk food today, so no ice cream. And we would try to say we weren't, but the bike would end, or the bike ride would end. We'd get back home, and right, the, the kids would, can we get chocolate tonight? Cookie dough? And we'd be like, no, we're not, this isn't an ice cream night. This is not an ice cream night at all. And what they would say back to us, right? But you promised. I did not promise. No ice cream, right? And everything that's happening is, in this text is around people's words. And But you promise, but you promise, but I promise, and I swear by this. And Jesus just comes in and he says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. And then he takes it so far to say in verse 37 that anything beyond that is evil and from Satan. That's crazy. That's harsh. That's the Sermon on the Mount. That's the road less traveled, isn't it? And I think about this, and 
what is it about this cultural moment that people don't necessarily take us at our word? Why is there so much skepticism in our society about people doing what they said they're going to do when they said they're going to do it? Why is it? Because I think we live in a world where the trustworthiness of our words is routinely questioned and the integrity of our words is central to our witness to Jesus. And here's what I want to do. I want to talk about why this is probably a problem in our society and hopefully what we can do about it. So two reasons that we can become unreliable and wishy-washy in our society. Number one is this, is that we don't like to disappoint people, right? I don't know, is that you? That's me, I don't like to disappoint people. (laughs) In a room this size, I would think that there's probably a lot of us we don't like when people are disappointed in us. And I remember I've used um, this example so many times. It's so life transforming and life transformational for me. But Kelsey and I, we had the opportunity to go to uh, Colorado for Mission Training International several years back to prepare to become missionaries. And there were people there that were going to countries all over the world. And, and so much of the teachings that I learned over that month, man, they just stuck, they've stuck with me. But one of the things they talked about is as you go into different cultures and as you go into different societies, and I've shared this before, is, is that whenever you go to certain places, there are going to be many, many, many differences that you will experience. And we as Americans sometimes can go into other cultures and be ethnocentric and think that all these differences are wrongs. And they were saying, yes, some of them are wrong, but some of them are just different. And as a missionary, it's going to be important if you're carrying the gospel of Jesus into this place, you, rather than go in and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, learn, sit, observe, study, and see what's different compared to what's wrong. But they were saying, one of the things that you will see that is wrong in some cultures, and I think we have a little bit of this in our culture, is that they were, they were saying there are certain cultures that some of you guys are moving to where you are going to go to that culture, you're going to go to that country, and you are going to invite somebody over for dinner, and they are going to say yes, and then they are not going to come. <laughs> they're like, yeah, because it's about saving face. They are not going to tell you no to your face. Or they're not going to say they have something else to your face. But when you have them face to face, they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. 7.30? Okay, great, great. And they're not going to be there. <laughs> And I remember learning that and being like, really? You know, and then everybody was like, yeah, I've been to where, you know, and they, it's like that. And it's like, wow. And there's something about people, us, where we like to save face. We don't like to disappoint people. And some of y'all, you may be a little bit like that and tempted to be like, yeah, I'll be there, but not, not go. And, and some of y'all might be a little bit more like me where you're like, yeah, and you don't want to disappoint. And then you'll be there. <laughs> and then you'll be tired because you did too much. <laughs> right? Because he said, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you go, 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 go. And you're like, oh my gosh. Which brings me to point number two, which I'll spend a little bit more time on. Number one, we don't like to disappoint people. Number two, we're moving at a pace that doesn't allow reflection of our commitments in relationship with our priorities. We're moving at a pace that doesn't allow reflection of our commitments in relation with our priorities. One of the things I talked about last Christmas season Um, is just the eras, not Taylor Swift eras tour, but the eras that we've lived in as a society, okay? And one of the eras that we have found ourselves in as Americans and as people in the world is we found ourselves into a big cultural shift that many of us are a little bit unaware of, right? And so what we've had, you know, back in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, whatever, is we had a society that was very disciplinary, okay? And when I say disciplinary, we were, we lived on basically two principles, okay? Number one is that you ought to do this, and you should. And number two is these are all the things that you cannot do based on whatever, So here's the things you ought to do, and here's the things you ought not to or you cannot do. The restrictions that you have based on how much money you have or based on the opportunities that you have or any of these things. So this was the era. And now we've taken a few 
shifts over 1980s onward into 2024 that we're in now, and we are almost becoming a people that are just inundated with, these are all the things that you can do. We're not going to talk about what you ought not to do. We're not going to talk about what you ought to do. We're not going to talk about what you can't do. We are going to basically throw every, all these different opportunities. What do you want to do with your life to maximize it? What do you want to do? You want to work out? Well, here's working out on steroids. Go for it. You want to, you want to be somebody who goes and lives, you know, an adventurous extreme life of vacations or whatever? Like, like here's a travel guide, a travel book. You want to be a kid that maximizes their potential? You want to have kids that maximize their potentials? Here's potential. Here's the 75 things that you can sign them up for that will make sure that they live a great life and become a great human being and a great person. Right? Like, you think, like, think about it. Like, we live in a society that says, doesn't say no, but basically throws everything at us at scale. And, and we just find ourselves like, well, I could do this. Well, I could do this. Well, I could do this. I can do this. I, I you know, I, and we think that we can. And it's almost as if one writer was saying, it's almost as if we are, and I use this word lightly, but it's almost as if we are a society that is being oppressed by options, <laughs> right? And, and the real danger in this, and I think this is what Jesus is getting at with it being evil, is that whenever everything is thrown at us at scale and opportunities abound and we could do everything, that it's like throwing our lives in a washing machine, <laughs> And we don't know which way is up and which way is down. And we can't make sense of our priorities and our values in light of that. Right? I was talking with our staff this week, and it's almost like, it's almost like so many of us, you, you know, we, we come into this room and, and we honestly, like when the song plays, you are my champion. When the next song plays, like, we're going to stand and there's going to be some of us that raise our hands. There's going to be some of us that close our eyes. There's going to be some of us that want a moment with God. And we know deep down intrinsically, right? We just know, like if you've followed Jesus for some time, if you haven't, man, I just, it's, it's beautiful and it's a wild ride. But it, there's, for, for many of us that follow Jesus for a while, he like, he's demanding. He wants all of us, right? He wants our lives. I mean, there's passages where he says, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross and deny yourself and follow me. There's other passages where, where Jesus is saying, like, he's like, if you want everything, if you want the whole world, if you want all the cans, the could be's that are thrown at you and you want all of them, you can have them, but you'll lose your life. But anybody who finds me and searches after me and searches after life in me will find what they're looking, like Jesus says all this, we know all this stuff. And I think that it's almost as if we, if we were to like, look, I mean, for, for, for lack of nothing better, if we, it's almost as if we were to like have a hierarchy ranking of our lives and to place our values and priorities. Many of us who've stepped across the line to follow Jesus in this room would say, okay, number one is my relationship with the Lord, right? I think when we get in a room we're ser and, we, and we're serious and we sing songs like you're my champion and all these different things, we would be like, yes, that is my number one. I need a rock solid relationship with Jesus. Many of us would say that. And then for, for many of us too, like following right below that would be like, hey, I have a spouse and I need a rock solid relationship with my spouse. Uh, I have some kids that fall into here maybe. And, I need, you know, to be a great dad or a great mom, a great parent when it comes here. And to be a great dad, great mom, great parent, I got to make a little money to, to help be a great dad, great mom, great parent and spouse and, and, you know, and then whatever else, right? Like there's other stuff. There's a five, six, seven, eight, nine <laughs> that happened there. But the problem is, is that we as a society move at a pace of could be, can do options where it's almost as like these things are flying at us. We're saying yes, we're saying yes, we're saying yes, and the life 
the washing machine of life tumbles everything around and all of a sudden fives become twos, sixes become ones, fours become threes, ones become seven. You get what I mean? And all of a sudden it's like, wait, 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 wait. and I got a loan, my value is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but the washing machine of life, the pace of life, the freneticness of life has, has made me say yes, 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 to where like the washing machine's happening over here and it's like, I don't even know what I value or what I prioritize anymore because I've said yes to so many things that this seems like a great option now. But then we let go of this and you, you, you get what I mean? Like it's just... And I really do think that that's why Jesus said, let your yes be yes, your no be no, and anything beyond that is from the evil one. Because there is nothing that Satan would like more than for you to make a seven a one. There isn't. There's just nothing. Because at that point, it's like, what are we doing? You get a few years on this planet and you're gone. And you're gonna live for that? And, you know what I mean? And then, and then here's where, I mean, here's where the text kind of lays it out, is that, and then we become people where our word doesn't mean anything. And we say yes to things we should say no to. We say no to things we should say yes, or we don't go, or we're not dependable, or we're unreliable, or we're wishy-washy. You, you know what I mean? And it just becomes an epidemic and a problem. And I think Jesus, a couple thousand years ago, speaks right to you and I, and he just says, man, it's going to be a great thing when you figure out your priorities and you say yes and no based on your priorities <laughs> and your values in life. It's going to be a great thing. It's going to be freeing for you. Just moving at a pace that doesn't allow us. And I, I think about this, and I think that the why behind it is that Jesus knew the propensity that this has to harm relationships. No one's ever been stood up for something or canceled and looked back on that moment and been like, wow, that was a bonding experience. <laughs> right? We just, we're so much closer now that you didn't show up. And, you know, and I think it's, it, it causes us to live for lesser things and neglect important things. So the integrity of our words is central to our witness to Jesus. Anybody read this book? Anybody? Yeah, we got one. Two. Classics, guys, classics. Okay. Horton hatches the egg. I'd never read it till yesterday either. I read the synopsis getting ready for the message this week, and I read Horton Hears a Who, but I had not read Horton Hatches the Egg. It's a masterpiece, y'all. So essentially, this is a book about an elephant named Horton and a bird that is lazy called Maisie. <laughs> Maisie the Lazy Bird. And Maisie the bird hatches an egg, okay, and starts to sit on her egg, preparing for it to crack. But gets bored, and tired, and lazy on the job. And so Maisie the Lazy Bird says, I would like to take a vacation to Palm Beach. And so she sees Horton pass, and Horton the elephant, and she says, Horton, will you sit on my egg? And Horton's like, I'm an elephant. Elephants don't sit on eggs. <laughs> I'm going to crack your egg. He's like, can you give it a try? Can you just give it a try? So he's like, okay, sure. And he gives it a try and finds out that he can sit on this egg. And she's like, I'll just be gone for a couple days. And she takes off for Palm Beach for vacation. And Horton's left sitting on this egg and realizes that he's in a tree and needs to prop up the tree. And so he reinforces the tree and gets it all set. And he's sitting on the egg. And meanwhile, Maisie the Lazy Bird is off in Palm Beach having a good time on the beach. And you know, doing what I guess seagulls do and, you know, flying around. And Horton is sitting here day after day after day after day in a tree on an egg because what his famous line of the book is, I meant what I said and I said what I meant. 
An elephant is faithful 100%. <laughs> That's the line. And first, the, the tormentors come, like all of Horton's friends or so-called friends come, and they say, that's a silly-looking elephant in a tree. <laughs> hey, idiot, why don't you get down? <laughs> and then after that, the storms come, like the rain, and he's sitting in the, the storms in a tree. And then after that, the seasons change, and his trunk has icicles hanging off of it. <laughs> And then after that, the hunters come, and he's like, I'm surely thinks he's going to die, and they're pointing rifles at him, and he's like, ah. but I admit what I said, and I said what I meant, an elephant's faithful 100%, and he sits in the tree, and he, and he takes it all in. But then the, the hunters don't hunt him. They capture him, dig up the tree, put it on a ship, and he's out in the ship for a couple weeks, and he's sold to a circus, a traveling circus, because... Who has ever seen an elephant in a tree sitting on an egg, <laughs> right? And so people come from everywhere to see an elephant in a tree sitting on an egg, and he's faithful the whole time. And eventually, the circus ends up near Palm Beach. And that's where we'll pick up today in the story, if you'll bear with me, for a children's book in church. We're going to do this more often. Then one day the circus show happened to reach a town way down south, not so far from Palm Beach, and dwaddling along way up high in the sky, who of all people should chance to fly by? That old good-for-nothing bird, runaway Maisie, still on vacation and still just as lazy, and spying the flags and the tents just below, she sang out, what fun? Why, I'll go to the show. So she sw swooped from the clouds through an open tent door. Good gracious, gasped Maisie, I've seen you before. Poor Horton looked up with his face white as chalk. He started to speak, but before he could talk, there rang out the noisiest, ear-splitting squeaks from the egg that he'd sat on for 51 weeks. A thumping, a bumping, a wild, alive scratching. My egg, shouted Horton, my egg, why, it's hatching. But it's mine, screamed the bird when she heard the egg crack. The work was all done, now she wanted it back. It's my egg, she sputtered. You stole it from me. Get off my nest and get out of my tree. Poor Horton back down with a sad, heavy heart. But at that very instant, the egg burst apart. And out of the pieces of red and white shell from the egg that he'd sat on so long and so well, Horton the elephant saw something whiz. It had ears and a tail and a trunk just like his. And the people came shouting, what's all this about? And they looked and they stared with their eyes popping out. Then they cheered and they cheered and they cheered more and more. They'd never seen anything like it before. My goodness, my gracious, they shouted my word. It's something brand new. It's an elephant bird. And it should be, it should be, it should be like that because Horton was faithful. He sat and he sat. He meant what he said and he said what he meant. And they sent him home happy 100%. It's a children's book, y'all. I read that to my kids last night and then we had a little conversation and they're like, that bird is trash. <laughs> that elephant is cool. <laughs> and it's just in a simple moment. It's like, man, don't you want to be like the elephant, guys? Don't you want to be like the elephant? Don't you want to be faithful? Don't you want to mean what you say and say what you mean? And let your yeses be yeses and noes be noes? Because I think that's what Jesus was getting at. I think that's echoing down. And, and, and what, I, what I said earlier, Ben, you guys can go ahead and come on forward if you're around. And what I said earlier to, to first service is this, is that so much of the commentary that we see from the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings and the commands of Jesus, so much of it is just coming back to that reality of what we said in week one or two is that you cannot love God without loving people in your life. You can't. You can't. And I'm adding a little commentary onto this, but I mean, it just seems to add up and it seems to make sense, but it's almost as if Jesus is saying with the commentary of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, after he said so much of what he said, is that the greatest command is to love God, to love people and all these different things. It's almost like God's coming back and with the commentary he's filling in and he's saying, with your 
words. The most loving thing that you can do for the people around you, the most loving thing that you can do in society at large with your words and with your oaths and with your promises and with all these different things is to let your yes be yes and your no be no. And when you do that, you will love those people and you will love me through it. You will be a person who is a strong witness for me through the integrity of your words and the faithfulness of who you are. But we're going to have to get over disappointing people and we're going to have to get over frenetic lives that don't make any sense of any values and priorities that we have so that we can live for him. And I share all of this so I can share this last verse because I think the, the heart behind our yeses being yeses and our noes being noes, why we sit here in a gymnasium and listen to the word of God and listen to teaching and sing songs is because we have a God who is faithful, right? We have a God who is faithful. We have a God who let his yeses be yeses and noes be no. We saw that in the life of Jesus on this planet. We did. He let his yeses be yeses and noes be noes. And he filled, he fulfilled his promises. Every promise that he's ever promised, he has fulfilled. And it is everything that he said he's going to do, as we're going to sing about and as we're going to read about, is yes and amen. And the biggest of that is through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's it. That's his biggest promise that he gave to you. You can have hope because you are forgiven. <laughs> so 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says this, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. All of his promises are yes and amen. And because of that, you can leave this place and you can let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes because you have a faithful God who has called you to be faithful like him. That's it. That's it. So we're going to take communion to commemorate his faithfulness today and we're going to be people who walk out of this room and we're going to do our best before him to let our yes be yes and our no be no it's that simple so Jesus I thank you thank you God for your blood that was poured out as the fulfillment of your promises for your body that was broken as the fulfillment of your promises 